to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of masculine spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. And soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now, here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is the Big Bang version of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You know, Paul, I love St. Paul. I've spent a year and a half really focusing on studying his life, reading a lot of books and, of course, what he's written, too, and visiting the footsteps of St. Paul uh, in Greece and uh, even to Crete and other places that he visited. And i got to tell you, uh, St. Paul had one a, a real favorite word. It wasn't love, it wasn't God, it wasn't Jesus. The word he used most often in the Greek is dynamo, which is, you know, power. And I here in, when I'm living in when I'm here in the Cocoa Beach side, when I'm here this time of year in Cocoa Beach, Florida, I could sit on my balcony. In fact, I was doing one of my Ocean Sunrise Catechisms live last week, and the people when they were watching it from my from my lanai uh, deck that looks over the ocean, they could watch the rocket when it was launching. Kennedy Space Center is just down the road here. Like maybe their launch pads are seven miles away, which is like having them right on top of your head. You feel the rumble, you hear the rumble, and you hear those rockets being launched into space. Uh, God, uh, God is a God of power. Remember, He made black holes. He made, He made uh, uh, quasars. It took four generations, as I understand it, of uh, of stars. Uh, uh, burning the the basic elements of the chemical table and then uh, exploding and then bur- furnacing those those elements and fusing making more elements to make just the parts that are in you so every part of your body is it comes from a star and so um, God is a god of power and so why do you worry why do you why do you think that God doesn't have everything under control um, our job is to abandon ourselves to his will and when you do that, you get to have the ride of your life. When you do that, when you're, when you're in the middle of God's will, you get to see things that you don't normally get to see. It's like those astronauts, when they went into space, when they, they had a total different perspective on life uh, when they viewed the earth from outer space. And it's the same thing with us. When you, when you abandon yourself to God's will, suddenly your whole perspective changes because you see God moving. You know, you're, you're in the middle of his will, and you begin to see, wow, what is that? What's God doing over there? What's God doing over here? And then you'll see a wall in front of you. You don't think you can get through, and oh, it just kind of disappears. There's nothing more, there's not a greater rush in the world than being uh, seeking to do God's will. I know my son, uh, Jeremiah, dropped into an 85-foot wave in Hawaii uh, in 2007. He was abandoned to that wave. Uh, He had to ride it over a mile and a half just to kick out. But I'll tell you what, uh, he had a perspective that forever changed his life. So we want to have that perspective. We want, uh, we want the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Those are initial apostles and disciples, they weren't all excited about doctrine. They were excited because they had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, a personal encounter with the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have a guest today who's uh, coming with both guns blazing and uh, is also, I would say, uh, a part, of, kind of a big bang sort of a guy because he's a nuclear Physicist, I can't, I even said it right. I even said it right. Uh, an engineer, a pilot, and many other things. But he's a, he's more than anything else. He's abandoned himself to God's will. He is. Uh, he his organization is called Discover His Church dot org. And Troy Guy is with us from Texas. Aloha, Troy. Aloha, Bear. Good to be with you. Good to be with your listeners too. Yeah, dynamite. You know, it's just the power, the power, the power of the Holy Spirit. So. Troy, Troy had a Baptist background and became a Catholic, which is interesting to me because I went to Baylor University. But uh, before we get started, I want to ask you this. When you began to make your conversion from uh, being a Southern Baptist or an evangelical to Catholicism, was that kind of like piloting an airplane with the, with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the engines on fire? Have you ever had an experience as a pilot of something like that? You know, I have, Bear. That's a, that's a great analogy. Uh, becoming Catholic is a, is a lot like uh, a time I was flying into uh, Galveston, uh, engine on fire, uh, smoke coming into the cockpit, and wings, you know, full of fuel, 
Uh, he oh. just taken off from a local airport and uh, had a Navy SEAL on board with me uh, as, a, as another instructor. And so we were coming into Galveston. I didn't know for sure how it was going to turn out. Uh, I was a little nervous. In fact, I was afraid. Um, but that's kind of like how it was, you know, coming from a 25-year Baptist, um, an anti-Catholic, uh, really, in the true sense of the word anti-Catholic. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, not sure where I was going to land, not sure how it was going to turn out. But the, but the closer I got to landing in the Catholic Church, um, ironically, the more comfortable I felt. Well, listen, and, uh, before you go any further with that, I want to hear about this, this engines on fire experience, you know, because that is a lot like what happens sometimes when we abandon ourselves to God's will. Like we know something radical is going to change. We're, you know, there, there's that little checklist you're supposed to go through when there's problems because I'm a private pilot, too. Not much, not much of one, but I, I, I learned, a, I've learned how to fly a plane. I got my license, but there's that little checklist they give you what to go through when things go wrong. But you know, you can't exactly Google search it and find it when there's smoke yeah. in the cockpit, right? So to, yeah, I right. want to hear, I want to hear exactly. I, I want to hear that story. I want to make it come to life for us. Well, the right answer is to check that. You know, let's go through your checklist. Uh, in reality, I didn't have a lot of time. You know, less than five thousand feet off the deck. Uh, coming in, just, you know, pretty hot. You know, there's smoke in the cockpit. Uh, need those need those wheels on the runway now. Um, so I went through emergency procedures, but in my mind, and and you know, it, it turned out good. Landed on the on the runway. Uh, they had a you know emergency crews, of course, out there, fire trucks. Um, it turns out it's a, it was a small fire. But you guys, but you know, you're like you're like those pi- you're like one of those pilots that always just understates everything. You know, like <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a little fire going here uh but don't worry we have two engines the other engine is just fine uh, but we'll be a little bit longer in our flight because we only have one in- oh there goes the other engine i guess we're going right. to be even longer in our flight that's but right. i want to know what happened you're, you're you were you you were landing or taking off and when did you first sense there was trouble and did you smell it or or see it or hear it first or tell me tell us about that yeah so you're coming in on the north end of galveston runway and, you know, you, there's a lot of helicopter traffic usually coming off of the oil rigs. Um, and so the first thing I noticed was smoke. You know, you start smelling things, you start seeing things, uh, and it starts coming up underneath the rudder pedals. Uh, that, that's a bad day. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, really, again, not knowing how it was going to turn out, you do go through emergency list, but you've been trained uh, thoroughly to go through that list in your head. If you don't have time, which is in, in my case, we didn't have time. Um, I assured uh, our Navy SEAL that was with me at the time that, that we were going to be okay. Uh, you know, but at the same time, we, it was interesting. We landed on the runway, and this Navy SEAL, big brute guy, you know, throws up all over the, the cockpit, just, just vomits all over the cockpit. And so what, what it brought home to me, though, is, you know, even in situations that are so uncertain that you have no idea how it's going to turn out, there's a certain faith aspect that says, you know, um, it's going to be okay. And so I liken that to my walk with Christ. Even though I don't see things the way they're going to turn out, you know, I, I, I have that faith in Him that, that yes, God, you have my back. Now, is, it, it isn't white-knuckle faith, like, yes, God, I just believe that I believe that I believe. There's a grace, there's a, there's a resting sort of. Real faith isn't white-knuckles. It's not trying hard. It's that you had that sense of peace and rest in the midst of the adversity that, you know, God was in control. One way or the other, you know, God was in control. You know, Barry, even if it didn't turn out the way I had hoped, um, which I thank the Lord it did, even if it didn't, I still had that peaceful faith in our Lord. Yeah, and that's that, just that sense because you've walked with him. But it's the Holy Spirit. It's not just a mental thing. Man. There's a presence of God in your heart. and. People don't understand that. Like, you know, I, uh, my, my wife ha- had a niece that really only liked to eat really narrow range of food. And she would say, look, why don't you try this food when she would take her out to eat? And I'll pay you a dollar if you do. And gradually she became a foodie. You know, it's kind of mm-hmm. like if you, you know, you've never tried. You, you don't. It's how do you explain what it's like to have a walk with the Lord? It's a, you can't explain it. You, you can just you, you got to live it. Maybe people will see it. Hey, is that a bunch of early church father books down there? I see. It is. Um, yeah. Jurgens back there. Yeah. yeah I got those same volumes. I have those same yeah. volumes. We're going to talk a little bit about that because I think that might have to do a little bit 
when we get back about your your transition from being a, a Baptist, a Southern Baptist, an anti-Catholic. Uh, you know, think about this, man. When I was in ba- at Baylor University, which is a great university, all my Baptist friends were praying for me to be a, to be converted, and I I was Catholic, but I, I really didn't have a understanding of who Jesus. I just I was raised Catholic, but as much as I tried, I didn't understand this whole personal relationship thing. And they were praying for me like crazy. And then uh, when they came back after the summer break, I had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and was so on fire for the Lord that I was evangelizing them. <laughs> you know? Amen. Amen. Awesome. If you were sitting yeah. alone in the cafeteria at Baylor, I feel bad for you because Bear's going to sit down and talk story with you about Jesus. We're Amen. talking with Troy Guy, and we're going to get into your conversion, uh, not how you originally came to the Lord and then your transition to Catholicism. Troy, how can people find you? discoverhischurch.com is the best place and you can reach out to me there and I'll answer your email personally. You will? Absolutely. So if I Every- write to you, you are going to write back personally? Especially you, Bear. But you have this great book too, I, I the the book called Evangelical Catholic. Yeah, it kind of explains your transition and they can find that there or where else can they find it? They can find that at discoverhischurch.com. Uh, they can also find it um, on Amazon as well. It's better if you go to his website. It's better for his ministry if you go there because they receive a little bit more of a spread. I'm a CPA, so I think like that. And we, at, we in the ministry know we, we need fuel just like you need fuel in that airplane. This is the Bear Wastick Adventure. We'll, we'll be right back. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite you to go to our website, deepadventure.com. Our webmaster is just like overwhelmed. We have so much going on in the ministry. We have the Ocean Sunrise Catechisms, which I teach every morning wherever I happen to be in the world. Usually there's an ocean behind me. Uh, we just, we're just we about to finish going through the entire catechism line by line for the first time. Uh, it's taken us almost three years. And then we got, guess what we're going to do? We're going to do the Didache. We're going to go through that original catechism of the church from around 50 AD. And then four days a week, we're going to go through the, the new catechism. But on Fridays, we're going to go through the, the Council of Trent uh, catechism. So it's just going to be a cool, uh, cool journey. It's definitely not a rewind. We're going to be doing all kinds of new things. So go to, the, go to the deepadventure.com. You can buy my books, Deep in the Wave, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, and Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. Uh, we have our Long Ride Home uh, TV show. If you become a Patreon donor, you actually can get all episodes of season one, all episodes of season two. And season three isn't even going to air for our six months or so, but you can get those episodes as we edit them. You get the director's cut. Plus, you get uh, the radio show uh, a month to two months, maybe three months before it even airs on EWTN. So come on, get over to our website and, and get your stuff. Uh, we're talking with Troy Guy. He, this is our um, Big Bang Theory episode uh, with a nuclear physicist, and I said it right again. You did. And uh, who's, a, who's a convert from uh, um, an atheist to a Baptist and then a Baptist to a Catholic. That's, that's a Big Bang. Bang. Yeah, that's a big bang. deal. So talk to us. Were you really an atheist or you just didn't care? You know, I was an atheist. I actually didn't believe there was a God. Um, you know, I saw the nature around us, said there's no need for a God. Um, but I wasn't anti-God. I just didn't believe there was a God. So you weren't an atheistic evangelist. Correct. You were just like he was on the shelf. Or, I mean, he just wasn't, he wasn't, he was an accessory you didn't need. It wasn't, you didn't believe he existed. Didn't believe he existed. Well, how does that, prayers. yeah. Yeah, we're that? great, great men and women of faith. Uh, I kind of looked at him and said, you know, that's for you, but, but there's really no God. It made me, it maybe it makes you feel better, but there's no God. Okay, yeah, it's, religion is good. And good. if that's good for you, then that's fine. You need, that's good. I think religion's good for society, but there's really no God. Yeah, that's it, yeah. But how did, you, how did you come to the realization that there is a God? You know, in uh, 1989, I uh, had an experience, a profound experience and encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. And it came through, believe it or not, a Bible verse that my grandparents, I believe, had left in our house and I had gotten my room, and on the little piece of paper, there was a verse that said, Fear, I am with you. And, of course, I'm looking around the room. There's nobody in the room. There's nothing, nobody even home. But wait, let's hold on a second. Right when you said fear, for I, it, it cut out the not word. So, it said, so, you, so what, what I heard just now was fear, for I am with you. But oh, the verse is fear not, for I am fear with you. Not. 
Okay. Right. I yeah, think yeah. God wanted Fear to not. emphasize. I think he wanted to emphasize that for us today. Fear yes. not, for I am with you. Okay. Definitely fear not. Um, and of course, I'm asking, you know, who, who, is, the, who is this that's talking to me? Um, I knew it was God. I immediately knew that I needed to know him more. And I was aware, a special awareness of, of my sinfulness. And so I went to my grandparents who were Southern Baptist and had been all their lives. And I said, I think God is talking to me and I want to know more about him. And so they introduced me to, to Jesus of the Bible and I became a Southern Baptist Christian, born again experience, as we said. Well, tell me, tell me about. Let's let's back up. So I'm not thinking from the head. I'm thinking more from the heart here. Yes, that's the beauty of it. They've been praying for you, and uh, and there's this this. I, I talk to so many people where they're taking a shower or they're looking off uh, in the distance from a vista. My la last person I spoke to, and suddenly it's like a window opens. That's Jesus knocking. And you went and spoke to them. And then what kind of prayer and what happened? What did you experience? So what I experienced is the love of Christ for the first time in my life. You actually <clears throat> felt his love. I literally felt his love, both in my body, my spirit, my soul, my mind. And I knew that it was the Jesus of the Bible, Nazareth. And so they introduced me to Scripture. They introduced me to how I should follow Christ. And then I followed him in baptism. Um, you know, a couple of weeks later and began my journey as a Southern Baptist for the next 25 years. And so in our Baptist church, you know, that's where some of the anti-Catholic thing came from, you know. Now, there's so much there's so much garbage out there. So, I mean, if, if you want to be Thomistic about it and say, this is what Catholics believe and this is what we believe and this is why we believe and why we're right, that's legit. People should do that. If they, they you know, that's the Thomistic way. But when they say this is what Catholics believe, and it's not even close to what we believe, it's like a, you know, they, a red herring, and then they argue against something we don't believe. There's a lot of that was going on when I was at Baylor, too. Oh, a lot in the Southern Baptist Church, or at least in my Southern Baptist Church. Uh, you know, worshiping Mary, you know, the typical things you hear. Well, like but what? Like what? What were these, some of these anti-Catholic things? All right, so the first one is we worship Mary. Catholics worship Mary. Wrong. Right. Ne never have never been a teaching of the church. Not a single Catholic I know has ever worshipped Mary. It's not a doctrine of the church. But yet we believed it and we believed it to be true. We believe that the ba had... Baptists believe that Catholics That's right. worship Mary. OK, absolutely. And you hear that whether it's whether it's said in public or it's you know said in private, that is the underlying thought that, that so many Baptists have of Catholics. They're Mary. And then and then what's so interesting Troy, is uh, they become Mary-phobic. So they can't even talk about Mary. You know, it's almost like she doesn't exist when she, she gave birth to Jesus and that's it. And so it's like they become Mary-phobic because they don't want to fall into this trap of worshiping Mary, which is not uh, what we do at all. Okay, next thing. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. You know, it's okay to talk about Paul. It's okay to talk about Peter and so many others. Well, you can't talk about Peter that much, but... Yeah, not that much. You uh, can talk about him before, his ap before Christ's death. But you can't talk about his work too much afterwards because, oh no, maybe he was the first pope. Yeah. Oh. Wow. It was James. It was James uh, that's supposed to be the first pope. <laughs> they think. Yeah. So go on. Uh, you know. So traditions of men. Um, mm -hmm. You know. There's a lot of traditions of men. Uh, we don't follow traditions of men. Uh, we word of God. You know, the inspired word of God, um, as though Catholics don't. Right. As if Catholics didn't. Uh, Put the uh, canon of the scriptures together. Yeah, yeah, that whole thing. And so, yeah. by the way, that's but, one thing that drew me back to the Catholic Church. Um, but that's the big thing. I, this moment hmm. right here that Jesus talked about, uh, apostolic authority. Who, who, everyone I ever sit, I sat next to someone on a cruise ship in Greece a month ago, and he said, "I'm a Church of Christ. We believe in what the Bible says. We don't tell anyone in our church what to do. We just tell them do what the Bible says. We follow the Bible." Talk to talk to us about that sola scriptura issue, and where, where do you find authority? Who makes the decision on how to apply Scripture? Well, the individual pastor, of course, you know, led by God, following the Holy Spirit alone, following the Bible alone, leads the individual flock. And so if you're a Baptist, for example, and you believe in, you know, you have to be an adult and you have to, you know, confess your sins as an adult— then you can be baptized, you know, adult but they, baptism. But they don't, they, don't, they don't see all the places in Scripture where the whole household was baptized. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or even the church next to them, you know, says, you know, for example, our Methodist brothers and sisters, uh, you know, some of the other Lutherans, non-denominate, they're baptizing babies daily. So the question comes down to authority. And who's, who's correct? I mean, literally on the same block, you can have three different churches, three different things, each claiming to be following the Bible alone and following the Holy Spirit alone. And I knew at that point, you know, something's very wrong. Houston, we have a problem in the Houston. In the, we have a problem. In the words of a nuclear physicist, yeah, that's right, that's right. So there's there's that. Well, uh, what, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There's um, you know there's there's a pope. I mean, we've got a pope that's what thousands of miles away from us, doesn't know us by name, you know, doesn't know anything about our lives, but yet he tells us how to live. He tells us what to believe. He tells us what to do in our own bedroom, and yet we call him the pope and we follow him. So we rejected that wholeheartedly. And said, look, we follow Jesus Christ alone. And so we didn't need a pope. And uh, so all these issues uh, aided in my anti-Catholic uh, philosophy and thought. But So we're going to take a break here in a moment. But at some point, I know, I, I know what happened. Because I can see in your bookcase, I've got that exact <laughs> same volume set. I could show it to you up here. It's the, it's the, um, the writings of the early church fathers. Um, give, give us just a a moment, just 30 seconds about how you got, how that start, how that started happening, how you got introduced to the, the early church. In our Baptist church, believe it or not, we had a, a, a course on the early church. So we were going to go back and we were going to take the things of the early church, apply them to the Baptist church and kind of be more like the early Christians. It was then I got in trouble. I started seeing in the early church that they had bishops. Well, where was my bishop in the Baptist church? They had this thing called Holy Eucharist. You know, the real presence of the Christ. The breaking of the bread, yeah. The breaking of the bread, and then their eyes were opened. As they say, mm. On, mm. So those things started hitting me like a ton of bricks. And I began seeing that there was this leader in the church, and there was this apostolic succession in the church, mm-hmm. and there was this thing called Mary, and it was venerated. Very, early. very important in the early church. Uh, in, in, in dealing with the Arian heresy and other things like that. Hey, we got to take a quick break here. We're talking with Troy Guy. He's a nuclear <laughs> physicist and engineer. He, his ministry is, I've got to put my glasses on to read it, to get it right, discoverhischurch.com. You want to check out his book, Evangelical Catholic. And I want to invite you guys to go, go to, uh, I want to invite the men to join Bear's Man Cave. It's a secret Facebook group. You can only join it by going to our website. You can't join it in Facebook, but you can go to deepadventure.com. Join our, join our Man Cave. We have men there that share and challenge, encourage, help mobilize each other. Uh, my, my catechism goes through there every day, and also about every two or three weeks we have a Zoom video chat meetup where we actually see each other face-to-face and help each other, help, each other, um, help launch each other's ministries. Uh, in ministry, especially specifically in ministry to men. Uh, we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to let everybody know Long Ride Home, our, our reality TV show, motorcycle-based TV show, is available on iTunes, Prime Video, Google Play, and... Uh, YouTube TV, and I'm speaking to you women now because I know we have men that really love our show, but the women are like desperately in love with this Long Ride Home TV show because they know if they can get their son or their husband or their brother-in-law to sit in front of the TV and watch one episode, they're going to be hooked and want to watch the whole series. So I encourage you to download the whole series uh, and um, come up some weekend or or, or, or holiday when, when the family's in town just kind of turn it on and have it running because it, it cinematically it captivates people so we encourage you to to check it out on those uh, on those different uh platforms we're talking with troy guy he is a physicist this is our big bang um episode my wife loves that show like what is wrong with her what is so, I, but i happen to like it a little bit too but it's just the corniest show in the world but anyway but we have our own big bang scientist here troy guy uh, who, was a, who was an atheist, became a believer, uh, had a born-again experience with his Baptist grandparents, and then 25 years serving in the Baptist church, and then uh, made a journey towards the Catholic church. So now, now, now let's talk about this moment, Troy. 
when you <clears throat> began to discover the early church fathers, where did you find them? How did you, what, what books were you reading? Were you reading their actual writings? or? So I had uh, gone online to evangelize, and uh, this was uh, back in the day of chat rooms, you know, and a gentleman that I met uh, was a solid Catholic, and he began to point out things like, hey, if you're going to pick on Catholics, at least pick on, as you mentioned, Bear, what we really believe. And part of that is this thing called apostolic succession. So he said, I want you to go back before Martin Luther. Now, that's the first issue I've There's got. nothing between the Bible and Martin Luther. There's just this big, empty void. Nothing happened. It's a, it's a space vacuum, if you will. Right, you know? yeah. And, and, and so it, it's one of those things you go back and your whole world begins to change because then you see 1,500 years of history that we didn't talk about in the Baptist Church. And so I began to see these things like we talked about, apostolic succession. And it was then that I began to look, okay, let me see it in context. So I would go back, literally get a copy of the early church fathers and read them night after night after night. And the church began to look less and less Protestant. Which, which, one, which, which of those fathers began to? St. Ignatius of Antioch. Oh, yes. Yeah. One of my favorite, Irenaeus. Irenaeus, when he's talked about heresy and he talks about the Pope and. Oh yeah, against heresies, in fact, is one of his big yeah. Justin and, and Martyr so, did it for me, man. Oh, Justin Martyr. Yeah, when he started, absolutely. when he started, it, it was at that moment, reading, when he wrote to the emperor and he and he and he wrote the words about the epiclesis, saying, you know, we're not cannibals, but we really do believe it's about because they had been accused they had been accused of cannibalism. When I read the epiclesis, and I go, holy. Sh- Dude, yeah, I know I know that those words we I hear them at Ma- I used to hear them at mass when I went to mass. Oh yeah, yeah, and, and you know as Saint Irenaeus, you know list the popes, you know, and here yeah. we have, you know, I mean we have a disciple of John, disciple of Polycarp, disciple. I mean those, these guys are so close to the apostles. You see, Clement's mentioned by by Paul in his letters, the third oh, I think the third yeah. pope. Yeah, absolutely. You can't you can't escape it, man. And so when you start looking at this, you say, hey, wait a minute. You know, I, I think I need to re- recheck this thing out, this church thing. And so that began my slippery slope to coming home to be a Catholic. Well, you know, you—go yeah. uh, what, what, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, you know, but I had never experienced a Mass. And, and one, of the, one of the neat things is, is that, okay, you know, Catholics are basically dead people, <clears throat> you know, in, in my mind. And they re-crucify Jesus every time they have Mass. Oh, they slaughter that's, him every time, right? That's the false teaching, yeah, that, that they say, yeah. That's right, they're bloody the sacrifice. But, but I had all this head knowledge, and I had it in the heart, but I had never experienced it personally. Mm. And so I said, I've got to go check this thing out. I went to this Mass, and I walked into this room, and I never had seen this on TV or anywhere else in my entire life where I saw people raising their hands and saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the salvation you've given me. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you for saving my soul and my family. Thank you for the healings. Thank you for the miracles you're working. And I began looking around and saying, this, this isn't a Catholic church. You know, if I had a blindfold on, I would say this is not a Catholic church. Was this the, the Charismatic Center in Houston? This yeah. is the Catholic Charismatic <laughs> Center in Houston. Man. Yeah, where Father Francis and our good friend, Father Mark Goring, who's just got transferred, but yeah, that's a great, that's trippy. I mean, it's, it's awesome going in there. I had a, I mean, I'm a charismatic Catholic, but I, when I went into Mass there, as soon as they made the sign of the cross, the Holy Spirit just, oh, very much needed that infusion of God's love. So you walked in there and they go, you know, you know how many, I think there's 180 million charismatic Catholics in the world today. Yeah, yeah, there is, there is. Yeah. And they're on fire for Christ, man. They, uh, so I experienced this for the first time and I said, okay, now I'm putting my, my Baptist background with the Bible, with all these church fathers, and with people praising the Lord with their hearts. I mean, pouring out their hearts. I said, this is my home. And so I started the journey uh, to come home to the Catholic. What, what was your thought? It's such, a, it's such a, a cultural shock to see a priest wearing robes. And what was your thought when you saw the altar? What was your, were you able to pay attention, or were you kind of like shell-shocked when you, the words of the, of, the, of the Mass itself and how scriptural it is? Oh, um, you know, I, I, I lack in my experience there back to like things like Scott Hunt had said whenever he first had that that moment of sitting back in a, in a mass saying, OK, there's this verse, there's that verse, you know. And I, I started doing the same thing, saying, OK, well, that's in the Bible, that's in the Bible. 
okay, these are the words of Christ at the Last Supper. Okay, when we process out, when we, you know, when we kneel and ask for forgiveness. And also, I, there's more. There's more scripture read. Just the the epistles, the Old Testament, yeah. the epistles, the Psalms, the Gospel. There's more scripture read. Uh, uh, the, besides the fact the whole mass of scripture, there's more scripture read in a single daily mass than I think in a Protestant church in at least a month or two because they're we reading a lot of scripture. Oh, absolutely. And you know, I learned too, Bear, that we're not we're not participants like I was in a in a in a Baptist church. We are um, we are participating in the mass, the holy mass. And so, actually, I should say we were not spectators. Right. And, and so many of those, so many of those uh, e- evangelical churches and the non-denominational churches, they really have a reach, and they do reach people for Christ, and people yeah. have a genuine conversion experience. But it's you kind of like. Sometimes when I've been there, I feel like I'm 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 at a I'm there to be entertained. Yes, in the stadium style seating, you know, the whole nine yards. Uh, and, and I I actually was very comfortable with that, by the way. You know, it's seeker uh, friendly. I, mean, I get it. I get it. Friendly. There's nothing less seeker friendly than a Catholic church, and you walk in there like, what are these people wearing <laughs> robes from two? You know, but I get it. But um, but it's still it's we're so fortunate to have the fullness of faith. Amen. We are. We are. And we invite, and, and the church asks all people to come home to that same fullness of faith, too. Uh, but you're right, Bear. You know, I want, and, and, and so becoming a, a Protestant to a Catholic was a huge experience, not only for me, but for my family. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough that after two years of study, when I knew I was going to become a Catholic, you know, the priest said, hey, your family is Which important. Which priest? Which priest? So there's a priest here in Houston. Okay. And it, it wasn't Father Mark. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it was a priest down here at St. Paul's. Okay. Is it, he said, but wait on your family if they're on the verge, you know, and then, and then you can come into. I already, already knew I was Catholic. In fact, I began writing evangelical Catholic as a Protestant. And so it was, it was a beautiful thing. I love that. You know, uh, my new bride, Cindy, I'm so blessed to be married with to her. When she was entering into the church, uh, I'm like, come on, you got to go to RCIA, you know. And I love the priest's words to her was you come when you're ready because it's so it's so much is the whole the draw of the holy spirit amen and at our rca class by the way we have the same thing you know we have a buddhist in there we have methodist in there we have baptist in there and there's not a pressure there's a genuine concern that says hey come in when you're ready when you read the catholic catechism it says that this is what we propose to you to believe it's not really preaching at people one of my friends uh who's a Baptist pastor, former Catholic, who was um, actually was sexually abused by a neighbor. And then when he went to the priest to get help, he tried to seduce him. So he has no bitterness towards the church. He, he realizes it's those individuals that had the issue. But so because of that, he kind of, found, he kind of uh, left the church. But he's been with us, and he's been seeking, about, seeking returning. And he says the thing that really struck him is the humbleness of the catechism. Oh, it's a it's a beautiful book. And even if you're not Catholic, I would say read the Catechism. You'll find so many things familiar to you, and you'll be overjoyed at the things that 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 God has done through through the Catechism. My ocean, my ocean sunrise Catechism. We have you know we have a good time. I mean, it's not just reading, uh, but I'm kind of giving anecdotes and teaching too. I would say maybe a third to half of the w- viewers are not Catholic. Oh, that's you, fantastic. The beauty of Facebook, right, and YouTube. Yeah. We're talking with Troy Guy. Troy, uh, where can they get your book? And don't say Amazon. Go to his website. Yes, discoverhischurch.com is the place to get Evangelical Catholic. Yeah, And also, I I point out, we have other other CDs on there, too. You know, questions Protestants must answer, as I did. Uh, How the Nicene Creed points you straight to the Catholic Church. They don't repeat that. They don't really use the Nicene Creed that much, right, in the Baptist Church. But we, you know, it's interesting. We we did recite it once a year at Christmas, and so that little thing in there about we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic was just kind of dismissed as a generalities, mm-hmm. and that really, you know, the early a, Christian a, a spiritual, but not a yeah spiritual spiritual church. Hey, so we're talking with Troy Guy. Uh, we have a great friend in common. I think Kim Sunderman, right? And then Father Mark yes. Goring from the Catholic Charismatic Center. Amen. Shout out to Kim, who's been helping us so much in our ministry. Uh, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be back with more with Troy Guy. Aloha, this is Bear Wozniak. Welcome to the 
Bear Wozniak Adventure, you know, I want to invite you to go to our website, deepadventure.com, and check out my books, Deep in the Wave, A Surfing Guide to the Soul. It was, it was uh, published by Hachet, the one of the hottest publishers in the world, and then Deep, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue by Franciscan Media. So both those books are kind of a one-two punch. Deep in the Wave, maybe for someone that is on a journey towards knowing Christ or wanting to go deeper, and then Deep Adventure is, is a solid, uh, good old Catholic teaching on the seven virtues, but it uses uh, my narrative and my anecdotal stories. In fact, Deep, Deep Adventure... As you read through it, about every fourth or fifth chapter, they're, four, they're short little chapters, five to seven pages. There's a, there's a, a story of an ocean rescue that I did in, in heavy surf in Hawaii, and it kind of illustrates uh, what the point I'm trying to make, but it kind of carries people through. So what I'm trying to say is that's a good book for you to give to a friend or, uh, or, or uh, uh, someone who uh, may not want to pick up a, you know, a, 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 some sort of, church book, but they would love to hear, read the stories and understand them. So do that. Go to our website, deepadventure.com, and you can get my books there. You go to the web store. we got some Long Ride Home cast member t-shirts there and Long Ride Home coffee cups and Long Ride Home motorcycle patches, too. <clears throat> hey, we're talking with Troy Guy. Uh, he is our resident nuclear physicist, pilot, engineer, and uh, a convert from uh, the Baptist world to Catholicism. Welcome back, Troy. Great to be back, Bear. Good being. So, what is on your heart right now? What is the mission? What is the what is the what is it you feel compelled to tell people now that you're here? Yeah, go ahead. One of the one of the biggest things I want to challenge men and women, children, um, is to rediscover their Catholic faith. Uh, you know, as I travel around, you know, I see a lot of things that, um, you know, as a Baptist coming into the church, I was on fire, if you will, excited about our faith. And I see some it's some areas there's a there's a lack of fire for their faith. They're, they, we don't know what we believe anymore. Relativism has creeped in. Lukewarmness has creeped in. And so Discoverous Church is is we set it up strictly to bring people back to the faith that they have and to become excited for the faith that they have as Catholics and to know why we believe and what we believe. And so I want to challenge men out there leading our families, leading our churches our priests, bishops, etc., to come back to the fundamentals of the faith. And, and I, I think that that's something that, that we're kind of missing today, especially with all the scandals. You know, people don't know what we believe anymore, what's going on in the church. But um, we do know. We can know. And so we, we can know, absolutely. Right. Even, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a student of history. Have you, ever, have you ever read Warren Carroll's six or seven volume set? Because I know you love history, too. I, I haven't completed it. Well, well, yeah, I love those books. But yes. when you read them, it gives you hope because you go, that pope was a jerk, you know. Oh, I mean, yeah, we had some bad popes. I know there was one pope once that made a, a big kind of financial deal, and he was kind of getting bribed. Uh, if he became pope, he would, do, he, would, he would support a certain heresy. And then after he became pope, the Holy Spirit just got a hold of him and shook, shook, shook that out of him. But I have so much confidence that, that the Holy Spirit is in charge of, of the church. And we, may have, we always have our ups and downs, but the Holy Spirit is always at work to renew Always, always. And, and, and that's a great point, that, that as I looked at becoming a Catholic, I never looked at it because of the moral behavior of, of clergy, you know, and said, okay, well, that's what I need to go home, you know, and I never looked at, you know, some of the older, you know, the, the popes in history and said, okay, all of them have exemplary lives, I want to be like them, so I want to become Catholic. No, I became Catholic because of the truths revealed by Jesus Christ, and you find those in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Or the Catholic Church, and then when you when you came to the Catholic Church, then uh, you, is it that that point when you were introduced to the uh, charismatic, what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or what was that? How did that come about in your life? What was that? So, like? so I had the baptism of the Holy Spirit um, at a at a conference I had uh, before becoming Catholic. It was reaffirmed as a Catholic, but uh, I was familiar with that with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I've enjoyed that in the Catholic charismatic movement. Uh, since becoming Catholic, you know, I, I my when I was uh, at Baylor, my mother kind of bribed me. If you go to this prayer meeting with me, I'll buy you a new pair of blue jeans. And there's a couple cute girls there too, by the way. And uh, and I was I was hungry for the Lord, but I I so it wasn't like I took took a lot of convincing. But when I went there and I realized these people actually have a personal when they pray, and they they actually think God is hearing, and it's as if they're having a conversation with God more than just 
I would do prayers as a religious act. Like they would, I figured they bounced off the ceiling, but it was a good thing to do. And yeah, I had a beautiful encounter with Jesus back uh, in Waco, Texas, when I was at Baylor. And we were part of this group called the New Heart Community. I really want someone, if someone from the New Heart Community is listening, I really want them to reach out to me. I want to come, come visit, see how you're doing all these many years later. Yeah. And how about you? How, how, how about you and your wife now? I know you have four children. How do you, how do you bring them up in the Lord? That is a great question. It is a challenge. Um, but I, I, I stay connected with the Lord through prayer. Uh, I've got a six year old, seven year old. Wait, wait, tell me about, I stay connected to the Lord through prayer. It's so interesting. When I asked you about your children, the first thing you talked about was prayer. What is your, what is your prayer life like? So, so, so when I come home from work, Bear, one of the things that I do often is stop by adoration and give all the cares of, of work to the Lord and, and that day's harvest. And I pray that God turns on my fatherly love for my kids when I come in that door, that I show them Christ before I show them anything to do with my work. And so I got this idea from a, uh, a cardiologist here in town, and that has been his practice for 20 years, when he leaves the clinic as a cardiologist, he says, I'm going to stop by, and by the way, he has nine kids, and, and I'm going to stop by adoration, and I'm going to pour my heart out to the Lord and prepare myself to be the domestic father, the domestic church leader of my home. And so I've taken that practice, and I can tell you, it, it is phenomenal. And so I do start by prayer uh, with my that, kids. That's a, incredible. So when he comes home, when you come home, your dad, <clears throat> you've left kind of the cares of the world behind you in that sense. And you've prayed for your family, and now you come home. And you, I know when my dad used to come home, I was afraid. When I'd hear his car coming up the road, oh, fear yeah. struck my heart. And, you know? Yeah. And, and you come home, but when they, hear your, when they hear Troy's coming home, they're like, Dad's coming home. <laughs> well, they get the water guns ready. You know, that's usually... <laughs> and, and, by the way, I'm one up on the kids too, but um, yeah. So that's the kind of thing I, I try to do. You, you, what do you mean one up? You're 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 the winner of the of the water. Uh, no, it's just the other way around. <laughs> so <laughs> so they have um yeah. My my younger son, he's he's got a water cannon. You know, the big biggest Texas, and so <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, I try to be dad. You know, when I come home, and I've always done that since I've become a Catholic. Um, which, by the way, is a shout out. Get to adoration, brothers and sisters. That it, it will change your life, and it is phenomenal. Um. So, so that's what I do with my kids. Uh, I come home, and then I spend time with my kids, um, and I think that they are priority. And so once I put them first uh, and ministry second, uh, it's, it's worked out really well. Do you, you and your wife have a common prayer life, too, to, that you do pray, spend time together? So that, that's a good question. We are, we are continually developing uh, our walk together. She was a, a Assemblies of God uh, before she converted to the Catholic Church. And so she's going through her own um, adventure, deep adventure, mm -hmm. uh, in the Catholic faith. And so we do uh, study the Word of God together. Uh, we do attend Mass uh, as often as we can. Sometimes they go to a, a different Mass because of the kids' ministries and things. Um, so we're still working on that. And that's an area that I, I, um, we're still praying on what is the best way to, to you know, bring up our children in the faith, given that we're so scattered. You know, we have small kids, we have teens, they're all over the map. So how do you do this in today's world? And so we're, we're learning that day by day. You have a common meal together at night usually? We do, absolutely. I think it's that's super critical. Yeah. You know, my wife and I have started going through Jeff Caven's series, The Great Adventure Bible Course, together. I know it's meant to be in a church environment, but we have it here. And it's been really cool uh, to kind of uh, do that together because I'm, I've been living strong for the Lord for a long time, and she's a rather new convert. And mm -hmm. so what's so cool about it is she brings such a unique and different and beautiful perspective on these Scripture verses. When, I've, when, you hear the same, when you've heard the verses again and again and again, it's really cool to have like that, that fresh new perspective. And then we usually uh, find a way to pray the rosary together during the day. It's really really helpful. Yeah. We're talking with Troy Guy. Troy, where can they find you? Discoverhischurch.com. Uh, we can also follow me at Catholic, at Catholic Troy on Twitter. And what about uh, speaking and things like that? Can they invite you to come to speak? Absolutely. Uh, now our fall, our fall series is getting backed up. Uh, so we, um, we, but we'd love to come out to parish, love to give missions, conferences, apologetics talk, or sometimes just talking to the men 
you know, in a small group setting works too. So yeah, definitely open to come out. We've been talking with Troy Guy. He, his, his uh, book is Evangelical Catholic. You can get that at his website. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, discoverschurch.com. We want to invite everybody to uh, go to our YouTube channel, the Bear Wozniak YouTube channel, and subscribe. Because there, uh, when, we have our, when we post up a new show, uh, you'll get to not just listen to the radio show but you, or listen to it in the podcast version, too. We have it on every possible podcast site. But you also get to um, actually you know, view the listeners, view, uh, view our guests. And if you go to deepadventure.com, our, our YouTube name is Bear Wozniak, and subscribe there and hit the little bell so you get the reminder. <laughs> but if you also go to Patreon and become a donor, I think it's at the $20 a month level. You get all of our Long Ride Home TV shows, the whole series for Series 1, Series 2, Series 3 as we're editing it, maybe even a year before the network even airs it. And we have about six, uh, six uh, seasons in the can that we're working on and editing. So we're excited to share that with you too. This has been the Bear Wastic Adventure. Until next time, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. And I have to say, I was reminded at uh, the Catholic Charismatic Center of Houston where uh, Troy attends Mass. Viva Cristo Rey! <laughs> you want to say it? That's the way you say it. Anyway. Yeah, but the, you end every Mass with that, right? We do. Uh, Father Goring did. And, and, that, and, and that's what we do now on Long Ride Home. Hey, we got to run, Troy. Uh, we'll be right back next week with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You've been listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Go to bearwozniak.com to get your free audio and other exciting content. Plus, you can pick up the Long Ride Home 10-episode DVD set, autographed copies of Bear's books, Long Ride Home shirts, tanks, coffee cups, and even motorcycle pins and patches. And find out how guys can sign up for Bear's Man Cave online Facebook group, all at bearwozniak.com.